Why don't we start with a little bit of sitting and uh, just kind of ease into things. So again, just this sense of beginning by stepping back and assessing where you are in your mind, in your body. How's your energy? How's your heart? With a quality of sensitivity for what's needed. What do I need in this moment to arrive, to settle, to come into balance? And then just opening to the possibility of feeling uplifted. So what, what can you connect with right here and now that brightens the heart? Sense of gratitude. Maybe attuning to or appreciating the quiet. The opportunity to practice. The presence of others to support us. It takes a little bit of energy, a little bit of effort to notice the blessings that are here. It's a particular way of looking, of attending to experience. Our minds are often habituated to notice what's not working and what we don't like, what's wrong, what we need to fix, what could be better, what could be different. So we're making space to notice aspects of the present conditions that are nourishing, that we appreciate. And this can be as simple as acknowledging that we have enough health, enough well-being, enough clarity in the mind to meditate to be present, to sit up, to lie down and be awake. It won't always be this way. And so once you find a condition to appreciate, 
particular aspect of these circumstances. And just let the mind dwell there. Just linger. Ah, I'm well enough to practice. Let yourself take it in. Have access to liberation teachings, teachings to free the heart and the mind. What a gift, what a blessing. And take it in. Like you're drinking a glass of cool water when you're thirsty. Like you're smelling the fresh air after the first rain. Like you're feeling the breeze on your face. Nothing else matters. You're just right here. Just receiving the presence of this blessing. Letting it fill you, letting it nourish you. Allowing the heart to be moved, to be touched. And to the degree that you're able to connect with this sense of gratitude, appreciation, just noticing the effect. Is there more energy available? Does the heart feel more buoyant, more light? Is there any shift in the willingness of the heart to be present, to apply attention and energy? Even if it's just a very small amount, you know, allow that rising energy, that sense of willingness or uplift to connect with the anchor. So that energy fuels the mind and the heart. Sense of, of yes, I'm here. And then we, we receive, we connect with what's present.
So as we explored yesterday, it's beginning to connect with something steady in your experience, like the breath, the body, sound. You choose your anchor. And there's that initial connection, sense of recognition. Ah, this is what's happening. And then you try to sustain the attention to stay in contact, continuity. Like you're feeling it, sensing it. There can be a sense of surrender to the simplicity of shamatha practice. Shamatha meaning calm, abiding. This is the phase of practice where we put everything else down. We just let the world inside and outside be just as it is and make a firm wholehearted commitment to attending to one thing, one breath, one sound. And there can be a deep sense of relief and ease in that simplicity, that singleness of intent. Nothing else matters just for right now. It's not a value judgment, it's not an absolute statement. We're just carving out a little bit of time. It's like getting a massage. You don't worry about the unresolved issue at work. You let go and allow yourself to just receive with a deep understanding that 
The more we can relax and be refreshed, the more resources, the more clarity, the more energy we have to give to the challenging problems of our lives. And so with shamatha practice, we put everything else down, not because it doesn't matter, or because we're avoiding it, but because we're replenishing our reserves, strengthening certain capacities.
We're bringing a warm and friendly attitude to ourselves, to the practice. So kind and patient attention. Imagine a small child learning something, learning some skill for the first time. And how you would encourage that child. You wouldn't take over and try to control what they were doing. Let them explore and experiment. And if they got discouraged, you would just gently connect. You'd just be right there with them. Yeah, it's hard sometimes. You'll get the hang of it. Just keep trying. Anytime they had a little bit of success, they're able to sustain the skill for a little. You would celebrate, you'd point it out. Hey, look at that. Nice work. See, you can do it. Just takes practice, keep going.
there's a verse from the Dhammapada, the collection of sayings of the Buddha, is one of the older texts in the early canon. The Buddha says, uh, irrigators channel water, fletchers straighten arrows, carpenters fashion wood, the wise train themselves. And I love this verse because it places spiritual practice within the context of a craft, so a craft of the heart, as a, a couple of Dhamma books are named, a craft of the heart. So the substance of the craft, the, the instrument, is our very heart, mind, and body. And so like any other craft, we need to learn uh, how, that, how that substance behaves. So if you work with wood, you have to know the different qualities of different woods. Some woods are harder, some woods are softer. Some woods absorb more or less uh, stain. And so with the heart and the mind, we need to work with them to spend time with this mind and body to get to know how it behaves, what's its nature, what happens when we push too hard? What happens when we don't engage enough? What happens if we just allow our mind to run amok, just kind of left to its own devices? Where does that lead? What happens if we try to control or contain it too much and don't give it enough space? How does it react? What particular um, experiences or uh, conditions does your mind gravitate towards? As we were practicing with earlier in the meditation, you know, what uplifts your heart? Where can you place your attention? What can you uh, focus on and connect with that brings a sense? of gratitude and brightness, appreciation and energy. You have to get to know your own heart and mind to discover that for yourself. So one of the most essential properties of human consciousness that we study, that we learn, to appreciate and to harness is the malleability of the heart and mind. The Buddha said, whatever the mind frequently thinks about and ponders upon, that will become its inclination. Whatever the mind frequently thinks about and ponders upon, that will become its inclination. So modern neuroscientists, neuroscience has proven this, what the Buddha understood and experienced in his own mind and body many thousands of years ago, that neurons that fire together, wire together, Hebsian neuroplasticity, that the more we send energy down a certain track in our mind and body, it kind of carves a little groove, makes it more likely that the energy of our life will flow in that direction. Another way of putting this, we're always practicing something. Always practicing something. So what are we practicing from day to day?
Are we practicing fear and agitation? Are we practicing control, self-centeredness, greed, resistance, rushing, putting pressure on ourselves or others? Are we practicing self-hatred, denigrating ourselves? How are we shaping the substance of our life? The wise train themselves. You can train uh, uh, a dog to be vicious, mistrusting, violent. You can train a dog to be gentle, loving. You can train the mind to be scattered, frightened, brittle, sour. You can train the mind to be flexible, generous, patient, loving, resilient. It was Henry David Thoreau who said, um, I have great faith in a seed. Convince me that there is a seed there and I am prepared to expect wonders. We talked about this a little bit yesterday that our consciousness contains the blueprints for awakening. This is called uh, bodhicitta in the Mahayana tradition, the seed of awakening present in all of us. So the Buddha said the mind is like the most fertile ground you could ever imagine. And when, when I say mind or heart, I'm referring to, um, in the Pali language, what's known as the chitta, chitta, which is translated alternatively as heart, mind, um, sometimes psyche. It's the, it's the center of, it's the seat of consciousness. It's where we feel and experience the world. Ajahn Sachito calls it the affective responsive center. So we are affected by things. Yeah. Someone looks at you in a certain way or says something kind or harsh and you, you feel it has, it has a, an, an effect on us where that effect lands, where we experience the impact of the world, the contact of life is the chitta. And it's where we respond from. Something, something moves in response. We see someone we care about in pain. We reach out. Oh, you okay? We uh, smell something foul, see something strikes us as repulsive, Ugh, we pull away, we respond. There's this um, vital capacity to engage with the world. This is the chitta. It feels, it's affected, it responds. So the Buddha said the chitta, the heart mind, is like the most fertile ground and soil you could imagine. Whatever you plant there, whatever seeds you cast will grow, will sprout. So every day, every moment, we're planting certain seeds, we're practicing something. And it's the nature of the chitta to, to, to nourish and um, kind of amplify the seeds we plant. 
part of the way it behaves, part of its function is to learn patterns. So everything we do becomes a certain kind of an imprint or a pattern that the heart then starts to get molded to. Another analogy that I, I really like is um, it's like water running down uh, a soft landscape. What happens when water runs through uh, soft earth? It carves a channel. And once there's a channel there, anytime water comes, it will go down that channel. Not only will it go down that channel, but it'll carve the groove deeper, right? Every time we send energy down a certain line of thought, certain emotion, certain way of relating, we, we strengthen that pattern in the heart-mind. We deepen the groove, it becomes more etched into our consciousness. So there are different energies in our lives. There are different and different qualities that flow through the chitta, that flow through our heart and mind. Which ones are we encouraging? The Buddha kind of classified these in a very broad and general way. He said there are two kinds of energies in life. There are energies that lead to our welfare and the welfare of others. So called skillful energies. They bring happiness, well-being to ourselves and others. And there are unskillful energies, energies that lead to the suffering and detriment of ourselves and others, lead to pain, distress, entanglement, complexity. Complexity in the negative sense, the sense of being entangled or lost. Each of these classes of energies, skillful and unskillful, have a, bear a certain mark. They have a certain energetic signature to them that we can learn to recognize. How does it feel to smile at someone? Just even as I say that, I smile. And it feels good. There's something bright, uplifting, open, spacious, clear, connected, warm, flexible, feels kind of soft and pliable. How does it feel to recoil from someone? I don't know if I trust you. How does it feel to kind of attack energy of, I don't like what you just said. How does that feel? It's hard, brittle, hot. Kind of closed, contracted energy sometimes. But not all of these energies feel the same, but they bear a certain quality. Skillful energies are uplifting. They feel more pleasant in a clean way rather than in an addictive way. So this isn't just about follow what feels good. That can lead to many dark places. This is about sensitizing our heart and mind to recognize, to discern the difference between these two classes of energies. So the skillful qualities, patience, kindness, compassion, generosity, honesty, integrity, clarity, 
energy, trust, joy, gladness. If we pay attention to the presence of these energies in our lives, we begin to get a feel for the underlying tone of what is skillful. Ah, that's how it feels. We pay attention to the unskillful energies, greed, hatred, fear, jealousy, pettiness, control, cruelty. reactivity, struggle, we get a feel for how, how those occur, what their tone is. So the Buddha's instructions for practice, one whole area of them centers around getting familiar with these two different strains of energies, of qualities, and starting to make wiser choices. He said, with the unskillful ones, try to steer clear of them. When you can, just avoid them. You notice that possibility of getting really riled up in a negative way or saying something sharp and you can just put it down or just not, nah, just not going to go there. He said, just don't go there. Put the mind somewhere else. Avoid it. And then he said, when you can't avoid it, when it comes up, he said, try to relate to it wisely so you're not feeding it. You're disengaging, you're withdrawing energy from them rather than feeding them. So we get angry about something. It doesn't mean suppressing the anger. It means understanding it. Okay, it's all right to be angry. This is natural. Let me feel this and understand it rather than feeding it, getting, continuing the story, getting angrier and angrier, chewing on it, digging it in deeper until we feel bitter and resentful. No, make space for it, allow it, but don't feed it. Don't encourage it. This is a whole art. We can talk about this more today. He said, with the skillful ones, the ones that are present, the ones that you experience already, encourage them, sustain them tend to be generous with others, keep going. Celebrate it and, and, and keep it going. He said the ones that you're not as familiar with, maybe, okay, I could be a little bit more patient, I tend to get impatient. He said, cultivate it. Learn how to do that. Bring it up. Reflect on it. Make it happen. And he was very clear. He said, I ask you to do this because it's possible. It's possible to avoid and let go of the unskillful. If it weren't possible, I wouldn't tell you to do it. But because it's possible, I encourage you to do it. He said, if it weren't possible to cultivate the skillful and sustain it, I wouldn't suggest that you do it. He said, but because it's possible, I ask you to do it because it's possible and because it's for our welfare. Irrigators channel water, Fletchers straighten arrows, carpenters fashion wood, the wise train themselves. So we're tending to the garden of our own heart and mind. We're cultivating the kinds of seeds that we want to grow. Shaping, shaping the very inner atmosphere of our life. Why? Why, why do this? Why pay attention to it? Wow. 
to suggest two, two reasons. In a very practical way, yesterday we talked about contexts. What's the context that we're starting from in our practice, in our lives? And the broadest, one of the broadest contexts that we're all sharing today of the sort of multiple layers of intersecting trauma that we're all living through, the pandemic, climate crisis, history of violence, oppression, enslavement, colonialism, the, the, the effects of which we are experiencing continually today in different ways. All of us, regardless of who we are, what our background is, it touches us differently in different ways. But it can't not touch us because it's the it's the field we're sitting in. And then the political divide, the rise of extremism. How do we function? How do we, how do we function in a way that's not just coping and getting by? Because coping and getting by essentially means just letting everything tumble forward? How do we actually use our life energy to participate in the unfolding of history in a way that steers towards a more just, equitable, kind, and loving future? That takes resources. And some of the resources that are in the shortest supply are spiritual resources, inner resources. Compassion, faith and trust, integrity, vision, love, connection. Cultivating the skillful provides a deep inner well that we can draw from to meet and engage with the reality of the world today. In whatever sphere of influence we have, whether that's our immediate family, our spouse, partner, children, parents, siblings, whether it's our workplace, be that a local organization or a multinational corporation, our community and society, whatever the fields of influence we have, the more skillful energies we've cultivated, we bring those to bear in all of those relationships and all of those decisions. We have more energy to offer. We have more clarity to offer. We have more calm and steadiness to offer when everyone else may be fatigued, freaked out overwhelmed, we can provide an island of relief and peace just through our own being. So cultivating these energies is a gift that we give to ourselves and to the world. But it goes further than that. The Buddha said, this is, this is the path to awakening. This is an essential component in the path to awakening. We need the right gear to awaken. We need the right conditions to awaken. Going back to that analogy of a seed, the blueprints of awakening that are within us. 
those blueprints get activated when certain conditions are present, just like a seed grows when the conditions of nourishment are present, sunlight, nutrients in the soil, water. So awakening, the seed of awakening starts to grow and bloom when the right nutriment is present. So cultivating these skillful qualities is, is introducing and uh, developing the inner atmosphere that will hasten, encourage the growth of that seed of awakening. This is, um, this is from the Majjhima Nikaya. The Buddha is talking about his own profound enlightenment, the night he sat beneath the Bodhi tree. And he describes the state of mind he was in. He describes the qualities that were present in his own consciousness that allowed him to have such a profound and deep awakening. So this is one translation of that description. He says, when my mind, and that word mind, that's chitta, okay? My heart mind, this feeling responsive center of awareness. When my chitta was thus collected, purified, bright, unblemished, rid of corruptions and obscurations, malleable, workable, steady, and imperturbable. I'll read it again. When my chitta was thus collected and concentrated, purified, bright, unblemished, rid of corruptions and obscurations, malleable, workable, steady, and imperturbable. It's a very, very particular description of a mind that's clear, bright, steady, energized, workable, malleable, it's flexible, it's not rigid, it has energy, it's ready to work, it's steady, it's balanced, imperturbable, nothing's going to shake me. So how do we deepen our spiritual practice? This is our theme for the weekend. Yesterday, we talked about these different uh, kind of templates, the templates of, template of, of a point and a context, understanding that any moment, any experience is always happening in a context. We can shift our focus from just what's happening to what's around me, what's the landscape within which it's happening, what are the other conditions present. We talked about the kind of arc or cycle of energies and how they develop on the path from the kind of lifting of uh, confidence and trust to gratitude to the initial application of energy and sustaining it, how that can lead to a sense of well being or gladness, and then that can steady, stabilize, become more uh, collected. And that from, that from that sort of tranquil, clear, collected place comes insight. The mind is, is this balance of energy and stability. One of the primary ways to deepen our spiritual practice is understanding the nature of the substance we're working with, that the heart and the mind are malleable, 
that the heart mind is it's a it's a intelligent flexible learning substance field and that whatever we put into there colors it starts to affect it so one way to deepen our practice is to begin to attend to what are the energies we're introducing to this incredibly sensitive intelligent shapeable substance of consciousness When you sit down to practice, how rigid is the mind? Are you forcing? Are you pushing? Are you controlling? Are you you kind of getting out the lash and ready to, uh, you know, beat yourself into submission? That's training your mind in a certain way. So how we practice is really important. The energies that we bring to bear and that we cultivate through the practice. This creates the inner atmosphere for awakening. It creates the conditions that will support the the natural unfolding of inner freedom. Once you start to get a feel for skillful versus unskillful, once you start to get a feel for how to show up and be present, how to encourage energy, how to allow the lulls when there's not enough energy and ride that out, then a lot of it is just about patience. Is just about putting in the time and allowing the conditions to unfold. You can't push the river. Just a certain quality of surrender to keep looking, to keep being present. It all sounds great, right? It's like, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, right, of course. Now, the tricky part is that we're not in control, right? You, you sit down to meditate or, you know, you get dressed for your day and you've got your coffee and you walk out of the house and it's like the world is doing its thing, right? You get a flat tire, you get a ticket, you're stuck in traffic, your boss dumps a whole thing on you. It's like the computer breaks down and you lose the, it's like the world is out of control. Not only that, our own mind to some degree is out of control, (laughs) right? So one of the skills that we need to develop, and that's really kind of the the, the fulcrum for, um, for the development of practice is how do we meet difficulty? How do we meet hardship and suffering? Because if everything just kind of flowed along, it was like, oh, be patient, be kind, be loving. It's like, yeah, no problem. But of course, it's like this dark cloud consumes us. And all of a sudden we feel this, you know, sinking self-pity and I've never succeeded in anything and I never will. And I've been doing this for 20 years and I still don't, you know, I haven't made any progress or, you know, whatever that is, we start, we get caught in these tangles. The, the consciousness snags on different things. We get stuck, we get pulled in, we get spun around. This is suffering. Things grab us. Because consciousness is so malleable and shapeable, certain particular energies grab it and we get stuck there. This is suffering. 
Dan Brown, a Tibetan teacher, he calls it, he calls it tanha, craving, he calls it grab. Really good word, really good translation, grab. The mind grabs onto certain things that don't help, but we get stuck there. So how do we meet those stuck places? That's really the place of practice. That's where the rubber meets the road. Well, this is the this is in a, to a certain degree the Buddha's instructions and teaching on the four noble truths is that there's the invitation, or could even say the um, instruction or exhortation to turn towards what's difficult. To really pay attention when we encounter these challenges and to learn from them. So, so far in our retreat, we've been talking a lot about the exclusive part of practice. Put everything else down, just come back, just be simple, just stay with this. Wonderful. Great. Just shut it all off. Let it be. Don't get involved really wonderful when we can do that you know to any degree it's a relief but it's not enough if it's all we do that's suppression that's avoidance <clears throat> so shamatha practice in uh, exclusive uh, mode of attention <clears throat> in the buddhist path is always in service of this this direction is always in service of inclusion, of embracing, of opening to the wholeness and the fullness of what it is to be human, which includes those places of being stuck, the places we don't like, that we don't want to see, that we don't want to feel. So how do we, how do, we do that? How do we find our balance there? So, of course, the first step is to just acknowledge it. We have, to, we have to be willing to be truthful and honest with ourselves when we're suffering, when we're stuck. To go, okay, I feel really depressed today. I feel really hopeless right now. I feel really lethargic right now. Or if you want to get even more refined, it, you take the eye out. This is lethargy. This is hopelessness. This is laziness. This is resentment. This is fear. This is anguish. This is overwhelm. Different energies, different patterns. They're not personal. They're universal. They're human. So we acknowledge it. We just, so just, to, just to step back. Okay, this is what this is. That's the first step. Then we learn to come into right relationship with these energies. It's like learning to dance with an opponent. Every opponent is different and they have different tricks to pull you in or to throw you down. You have to learn how to hold your ground how to not get too close to some of them because they'll clobber you, but how to not run away either because then they lurk in the shadows and will jump out when you're not expecting them. You wanna keep them in the light. You wanna be able to see them and you wanna study them. You wanna observe them to find out how they function. Where, where, where are they, you know, what are they trying to do? The analogy kind of loses its relevance at a certain point. So to come into right relationship with these energies means to observe them with curiosity and kindness. With curiosity, kindness, and balance. And that's the last one is the key. Because they have this this mesmerizing quality to them that can overtake the mind 
we need to keep a little bit of distance. How much distance you keep from the painful, difficult energies depends on how much mindfulness and concentration is present in your mind. The more mindfulness and concentration, the closer you can get without them taking over. The more intimate you can get. You can be right in the heart of anger or grief and still be free when mindfulness and concentration are strong. The weaker mindfulness and concentration are, the more distance you need. So you regard it from a distance psychically, emotionally, energetically. What does that look like? Maybe you have your eyes open. Maybe you're with your anchor predominantly, but you're aware that there's this overall mood of heaviness or fatigue. So, okay, this is how it is. Just stay with the anchor. And then you acknowledge it. Yeah, it feels like this. And you come back. The beauty of the process is that these energies, their nature is to dissolve. Our job is to just observe them, to feel them and allow them to be present. And then they dissolve on their own and the heart learns how to relate to them. The heart learns the mechanism of how we get stuck in them. How? By getting stuck and unstuck, by getting stuck and unstuck again and again and again. So the release happens on its own when the conditions are right. So our job is to focus not on making something happen, not on getting rid of anger, fear, pain, grief, but on creating the conditions to be aware of those energies in a balanced way, they release themselves and the heart learns by observing and staying in right relationship with them. Our job is to bring interest, kindness, patience to the process. And then we're back to cultivating those skillful energies, tending to the, the soil, what are the energies that are needed to just allow this process to unfold? Okay, so I'll stop there. There's uh, some different perspectives for you to take in. We've uh, been sitting for a little while, so I want to shift the energy here. Maybe let's just um, just take a few moments of quiet to just let let that settle. <laughs> <laughs>